Man, the world's most dangerous group, NWA. Stand up. Yeah. Now, a lot of y'all don't know about the history of NWA. You know, when they made Straight out of Compton, I made basically history explaining to you the details of everything that was happening during that time in NWA and how false it was from the truth and how Lonzo played a bigger role in actually them coming together and actually having so having Lonzo, who knew how the business was structured and how to have a studio and record in his garage and, and all this stuff, you know, like these are the type of things that are put in place for a reason, right? But when NWA took off and became NWA, you know what I'm saying? It became a, a unexpected phenomenon. You know, Ice T was making those hardcore records, and there was a couple of other guys uh, that was making hardcore records in the streets, but they never made it to this type of outlet because no major really would have signed them. So it took an unknown label like Priority, who had never had a record in their life, to put out such a. Uh, You know, such records as what they were putting out at the time. It was risque. They were just known for jingles that was in commercials and things of that nature. Now, getting to the gist of what this video is about, and don't forget to uh, super chat. Hit up the cash app, which is Carcino for Life. It says it in the banner. The Patreon version will be way better than this. This is the PG version right now. The Patreon version is going to make your mouth drop. But right now, we want to go into detail about situations and how they present themselves to um, mainstream Americans. Now, when you look at this, right? And you start saying to yourself, well, this seems like a, okay, an everyday thing. Hip-hop artists known to travel like 10 groups a show, like back in the 80s. You know, like you could pay like $15 and $10 to get in, you know, and sit and watch a show. And you'll have about 10 acts. And nobody was wasting anybody. You know, it was a great night of hip-hop entertainment. You know, and that's what we're about. Now, when you went on Broad Street <laughs> out there at the Spectrum, where they used to have it, or the Joe Louis Arena in St. Louis, or whatever you were, you saw a show. You know, Chicago, they had need sometimes they would perform at on the north side, or they had uh, a couple other show spots. It wasn't the Airy Crown. Sometimes, you know, if you were big enough, you could make the Airy Crown. But normally it was on the north side and it was a an old center, you know, where people would go and perform at. It was never, like, too much on the south side. When they had the one on the south side, it was their first and last show only. <laughs> um, but normally on State Street, you know, they had uh, places out there. You had the Palladium. It's a lot of old places that are not, like, there anymore. I mean, Easy e would be on tour with Public Enemy. They would be up there with uh, Too Short, Kid and Play, Kwame. Not Kwame, Kwame at that time. 
three times dope and JJ fat. <laughs> that would be a show. Yeah, LL Cool J. They would all have to jump on the same card. So it didn't even matter if it didn't fit. Like, you wouldn't see NWA in Too Short and, you know, expect the Fresh Prince of Bel Air to be there. And yeah, it'd be the Fresh Prince of Bel Air <laughs> with NWA, would be, you know, you had to get in where you fit in because hip hop wasn't really accepted at that time as a classified art form like it is now where you can have one artist and he had to do the whole show the whole night. You know, these guys paved the way for that to happen. You know, guys used to have to entertain you when they were on stage. So, during this era, there was a lot of things going on. Now, everybody talk about Kells and Kells and these, what man, look at all these underage girls. Buddy, boy, buddy, boy, buddy, boy. If I told you your greatest rappers of all times, like all of the artists back in those days, a lot of them had young girls. A lot of them. So, I mean, it just was not frowned upon as the way it was. It was mostly how that person carried themselves based on the number of, you know, the age that they were. It would be a 16, 17-year-old hanging out with a 25-year-old females in groups at that time because young teenage fast girls wanted to all date older men. They wanted to go out and they want to be grown so bad. So they rolled with the older people. They had fake IDs. They got into places. So a lot of these women were deceptive in their ways and the way they carried themselves. They treated themselves as older because their bodies matured faster than their brains. And a lot of rappers was just taking it because they were groupies. And man, oh man, oh man. I can't think of a rougher case than the movement of NWA because it was different with them. They were known for objectifying women. Whether the other ones did it or not, their music was known for objectifying women using the B word to call them this and that and just totally barrage women. The women... <laughs> would throw themselves more at them and they would allow them to be called B-words. They would allow members of the group to call them the B-word and not be offended. Other rappers were shot. Short Dog was more polite than N.W.A. was. So people never really understood how success worked or how anything was going down. It was basically a situation where you're either in or you out. With NWA, it was, we are all in. There is no out. And in the early 80s and 90s, it was considered crazy or didn't make any sense. When... Um, Somebody went against status quo and just turning down women that's all coming in the room. Nobody was carding these girls. It wasn't like NWA came out and said, we finna target underage girls. They just didn't give up. Beep. A girl be in there running off at the mouth and they'll just say, hey, you know what this is. They come in there. They start drinking. They start going in there. You know, some smoking cigarettes. It was all kind of craziness going on at the time. But you 
nothing can get more realer or more evident of being just out of control than the 1989 like they was just doing shows out on the road So in 1989, you start seeing Yeah, so in 1989, I'm sorry, I was distracted. So in 1989, there was a, a huge situation. So after 1989, you start looking at uh, an entirely different uh, look for the for the NWA group. In 1989, things was getting rough. Uh, uh, Cube had just left the group. Things was getting a little bit more rugged. Doc was on the group and. It was all about DOC pushing him and everything else, and they doing shows, and people were getting more and more. It was getting dangerous at this point, and guys were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing, and they were on the tour bus, taking girls on the tour bus and just running through them. Three full guys on one girl. Other girls going in. Nobody's really asking too many questions. So I'm not like blaming NWA, but they didn't give a damn. They didn't give a damn if the one girl was an underage girl. There was an instance where one time an underage girl got on that bus. And she looked underage. They didn't care. She was ready to get down, and she got down. This was going on mostly with NWA more than any other group, period, because the girls that they were good, that was coming for them were, they were hoes. <laughs> they were hoes. To say the least. Now, I don't want to disparage a lot of players. I mean, players. Uh, like artists in the game by singling out in WA, but there were a lot of cases. Um, there's a case that happened in St. Louis where the girl claimed that she was hit in the face because she wouldn't, you know, do oral and she was hit in the face and forced to do oral and she didn't do it. And the girl was 17. There was another one in, um, I want to say New York, where one of the girls uh, said that she got, you know, spit on by an NWA member and all of this because she wouldn't get down with all four of the band members or at least four or more. That's what they said, four or more of the band members. Then there was a incident in Alabama where a 16-year-old girl
yeah, well, the 16-year-old girl is... Well, at the time, she was 16. Sorry about that. So at the time of her being 16 years of age, um, it changed the dynamic of what uh, people wanted to wanted to do as far as a case. Now, this probably would have been blown by had the girl not ended up pregnant. Now, she said she was assaulted by four or more members of the group. She was 16 years old. Now, she winded up pregnant out of, out of the situation. And after she ended up pregnant, then, of course, she... Uh, they said the test the, the test came back 99.8% MC Ren was the father. But Ren passed the a lie detector test. Um, and it was a it's a bit of a problem that situation. But needless to say NWA had a rougher time. Easy E was had to go in for deposition as this thing went on for four years because there was a baby involved. Um, Easy E said, "There's no way MC Ren would never R word a woman without wearing a prophylactic." So I guess. He's innocent of being a father. <laughs> I mean, just being a smart ass, but still, to actually go into a deposition and say that is just absolutely crazy. But this is how it was back in those days. And not just singling out just in WA, it's just that they brought a certain type of women that came to see them. And was they didn't care. They would care if they was objectified or not. All the other artists that was in the game that was there didn't really objectify women in their music. So, you know, it was different for them than anything else. Now, I'm trying to go through this as nicely as possible without it, you know, getting to the level where this is going to go on the Patreon. But what I will tell you And what I can tell you is that uh, this is going to increase the way we look at situations back then and now. Nobody's saying it's right. Nobody's saying what's wrong. A lot of this was consensual. But there were, this was a norm back in those days. You 
You know what I'm saying? Like, this was a normal thing back then. You know, I'm... And I'm not saying the other rappers didn't have underage groupies, too, which a lot of them did. Some of them, when they knew, they didn't care, because I, I told you it was the way these people carried themselves and how they moved about. So... I've always prided myself on doing different things, you know, like on oh, being aware now in today's climate, people are a little bit more cautious about that because of how things are today. But back then, no it was not regulated. Uh, people really weren't checking for IDs of how old you were and things of that nature. And a lot of people had fake IDs just to get in places. So you never really knew. And at the artist, you were vulnerable. And then you got people that's on your, in your crew that's messing your name up. Like there's people that's involved in a lot of situations that's like, you know, involved with the group, but they're not actual, the members of the band. You know, they like homeboys of the band member. And then next thing you know, it's gonna say NWA. It's not gonna say this dude from <laughs> the band. Well, here is, Here is the scenario, right? MC Ren was what you would call a person that rapped life. You know, like when he was rapping about was the type of things that he was involved in or got involved in. You know, in situations that he's seen around Compton, like a lot of other rappers rap about what their environment was. So when he had the surprise part two, and this was normally the MC Ren record by himself when he did, it's the worst, man. Just don't bite it, you know. Part two, when he did Just Don't Bite It, part two, not the surprise part two. But Just Don't Bite It, part two, when he started talking about how the girl was 14 and it was the daughter of the girl he was on a date with at a drive in, and then he went into the car and everybody was like taking turns on the girl and and he was next, and then when he got up to the girl, he found out it's the daughter. And she was, like, giving BJs, <laughs> you know, in the car. And his turn was, like, next. <laughs> and when he saw who it was, he didn't say, hey, you know, this is her 14-year-old daughter, let me stop. Nope. Go ahead and... You know, and a lot of this was MC's Ren's uh, this was MC Ren's uh, the way that he plays. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the way Ren, you know, got down in a lot of his rhymes. It was similar to this. If you look, listen to the song Behind the Scenes, it's about 
all of his homies going to the house, the parents, all of them all messing around with the daughter and everything else. And his buddies all jumping in and they all start taking turns on the girl. So a lot of his songs are when it comes to these exploits is grouped. You know what I'm saying? It's like a group mentality. Yeah, it's whether it's true or fantasy, it paints a bad image when you're being sued for just such actions. You know what I'm saying? When you're being sued for such actions, um, you know, it's kind of hard for um, when your music is basically, this is what we do. Whether it was legal or unlegal, whatever the case may be, it's a little difficult to change and say this is your image. And, you know, Ren found Islam and got out of this situation. I mean, it, they settled that case for millions of dollars with the girl from Alabama. And you know, the record label paid the settlement, supposedly, and got past it. And things had to change from there. You know, Rand basically eventually changed the way, you know, he was living his life uh, at that time and got away from those things and got towards Islam and bettered himself. But it wasn't just Rand. You know, like, it, it's, you know, Dr. Dre, it's a lot of them, so. Now, uh, Dre exploits was even worse. Um, Dre um, was one of the people who was accused at that time, but it was dropped. The case was dropped for lack of evidence when she said this one girl said she was punched and the girl is from, um, she's from uh, Michigan, but I can't think of which city, I'm sorry, but she was from Michigan, claimed that Dr. Dre, the uh, NWA rapper Dr. Dre was the one that struck her in the face. There's so many of these cases that Jerry Heller had to put out these fires. Even Suge Knight <laughs> was, when NWA was, when he had the group, he was sitting there uh, basically trying to put this fire out. I would never say he changed his direction to try to, you know, for the case, like he became Islam just for uh, the case. I would never say that. Because that's completely not true. But let me just tell you this. It was a bit of a problem. A huge problem. Now, in today's world, that case would have, when it went the way it did, it would have been a lot more severe. And NWA would have faced a lot more criticism. But it is what it is. Just wait to the Patreon version where I can get un unhinged. But, um, yeah, we'll leave it here and the rest will be on the Patreon. But now at least you know what is the scope of it and what we're really getting involved in. So I try to do this as very PG as possible, choosing and selecting words very carefully 
Um, shouts out to Kwame Brown Bus Life. Shouts out to Ticket TV, Armando Black TV, Angela Stanton King, and definitely shouts out to the rest of you guys out there. And I want to say uh, thanks for your support. Hopefully you all hit the like button and I'm out.